All right, I'm Jeffrey Taylor. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. I'm, I'm going to take you on a little journey of uh, life as a rural artist and how that all began. So I was 18 or 19 years old and uh, was riding in a car away from the summer camp that I was working at. And uh, I don't remember all the names and faces of the people in the car, but I do remember um, one specific thing from that day. And uh, so we drove off the, uh, the gravel road onto the highway and turned uh, south. We were heading from Arlington Beach, where we were working, to uh, go to Regina, probably, for a, a night off. And we were young. Life was full of possibility. Everything was exciting, uh, bigger than we could possibly imagine the world before us. And I looked over to my right as we were driving by, and I saw that. And I said out loud to the girl next to me, why would anybody ever live there? So let's go back to the beginning, the first place I lived. That's me. I'm going to show and tell you today the path I followed, eventually finding a place to live, create, and thrive, and to start to do define what success meant for me. I grew up on a farm in the southeast corner of the province. You can see it was a pretty wet year that year. My dad will tell you stories of how bad that was. And he's here today, so thanks for coming, Dad. So our farm was in the southeast, southeast corner of the province, now the, near the nearly non-existent hamlet of Parkman, farming, oil, hockey, and hunting. Like a large part of rural Saskatchewan was the way of life with very little visible art, or at least nothing of note that I was aware of other than comic books and cartoons. Uh, we attended church on Sundays, and in addition to the, uh, the farming, oil, hockey, and hunting, the, that faith was central to our life. My mother, who's also here today, was creative writing music, decorating elaborate, ornate wedding cakes, and enjoying experimenting with the visual arts. Um, as kids, we were bused to school in the K-12 school in Strasbourg, not Strasbourg, sorry, in Manor. And I remember receiving high praise in grade five or six. Um, I'm getting a lot of S in here, is that? Sorry, went to the Creative 12 school in Manor. Uh, I remember receiving high praise in grade five or six for a drawing of an elephant that I had made, and the teacher hung it in the hallway, and I thought I was quite proud of that. But in high school, there was no art courses offered and uh, just segments of art wedged into the rest of the curriculum. So I got art where I could, but it wasn't very often. Our family moved off the farm for the winters when I was 11, and my parents were doing evangelistic work and had a vision of starting a church in Manor. And Manor was a strange mix of things for me. I was a creative kid and didn't really fit into the mold of the culture around me, always reading and drawing and building. I quit hockey when I was 12 because skates hurt my feet, and I was too soft-hearted to be a hunter. I spent summers going to camp and working odd jobs. I started a greenhouse business, painted houses, worked as a camp counselor. I had two worlds, one where I felt accepted at church and youth group, and one at school and in the small community where I was the weird kid who didn't think like other people. One time I built a town out of snow in our yard. It was pretty big and elaborate, and I'd taken many hours of work to build it. I was super proud of it. And someone ran it down with their snowmobile that night. That was literally crushing, and one of the many times I felt bullied there. My parents were doing what they could to encourage me artistically, but weren't aware of too many resources, and I acted in school plays and, and did things like that, and took music lessons and things like that. Um, one of the nicest things they did for me was allowed me to graffiti my room one year. And then to cover up the graffiti, we got to, they allowed me to renovate the entire room however I liked it. So we built a raised bed and a special spot for my art desk, um, lined the walls with cedar. It was quite beautiful. And around that time, I was building this, and I had this desk that was up high, and I thought, oh, it would be cool to have a secret entrance to an underground uh, science lab where you could hide out and do experiments. So. So summer camp is going to come up a fair bit because Arlington Beach, where the story started, um, it was one of the places where I got to explore craft. One summer, a man came and taught us wood carving, and this was the piece that I made there. Uh, he was quite impressed with what I'd done and uh, gave me his Dremel tool after the week of camp, which was amazing. And I still have that one today. So, By grade 11, I didn't feel like my creativity was something that was really admired, and I wanted more friends, so in an attempt to gain a bit of social status, I decided to throw a small party while my parents were away. I invited a few friends, cooked a huge pot of chili, and acquired some illicit booze. 
And as happens in small towns and large, word of the party spread and things got a little out of hand. I had no idea how many people showed up, but the house was full and the neighbors who attended our church definitely noticed. Uh, when my parents returned, I was given two choices, be grounded for a very long time or go to Christian private school at Cairnport for my grade 12 year. Successful party aside, I didn't have many emotional ties to Manor, so I chose to, to attend the private school. So going to Cairnport for grade 12 was uh, instrumental in the rest of my life. It set the creative direction for me. Uh, if I'd stayed in Manor, my grad class would have been six people. And at Cairnport, I had a grad class of 98 people, which was pretty incredible. And the, the school itself was almost the same size as my hometown had been. Uh, I took on as much creative activity as I could. I joined the, uh, the tour choir and got a solo doing that. And for the first time ever, I had dedicated art classes and so I was able to take grade 10, 11, and 12 art all in one year at the expense of dropping my, science and my sciences, which now as a potter, chemistry would be handy. But, oops. So there's my, some of my high school pots. <clears throat> I would, at Cairnport, I was introduced to pottery with a wonderful teacher named Ken Ginter who not only taught in class, but practices artistic pursuits outside of class and operated his home studio. Many of my hours outside of class were spent in the uh, pottery studio at school. And I didn't have a vision for what I wanted to do with my life after graduation, so I returned to Cairnport after graduating for two years of Bible college. Took up skateboarding, kept drawing, writing, explored poetry classes, and att occasionally attempted some sculpture. So I'm at a Bible college, and I think somebody got offended and thought I was making a reference to some sort of Old Testament idol worship. And the day after I made this, they destroyed it overnight. And so it kind of felt like that snow sculpture as a kid again. Nobody talked to me about it to see what actually was going on. So anyway, I'm making assumptions. I don't know why it went, got broken. Friends from college encouraged me to move to Red Deer. There I found employment at a large institution for adults with special needs, which was one of the last places of its kind in, in Western Canada anyway, and working there taught me a lot about compassion. So while I was in Red Deer, I joined the local pottery guild, keeping my interest in clay alive, but as you can see by the pots, not focusing very hard on, uh, on making good pots at that point. Uh, and after about eight months uh, living in Red Deer, the place where I was working closed down and I decided that I really wanted to pursue the pottery thing, so I was gonna move back to Saskatchewan. I set up my first pottery studio in our family's cabin at Arlington Beach, and I lived there with six cats, no running water in the winter, and a cracked heat exchanger on my furnace. And this is a tea set that I made during that period. And so I soon realized that I needed additional training and applied to go back to Red Deer College, where I'd heard the ceramics program was quite good and I entered art school the second semester of 1993 and knew instantly I'd found a home with people who longed to create like I did. And often I'd be the first person in the studio with my tea and a muffin, soaking up all the stuff that I could while I was there. So my pots were improving a little bit while I was there. So at a group while I was there, a group of us started a student art gallery at the back of our local record store and held openings and art shows. It was quite, quite a lot of fun. And our ceramics instructor was well connected with the international ceramics scene. He held summer residencies, which I attended and was able to work with around uh, ceramicists from around the world. Uh, those summer residencies were as important to me as the regular school year. So my pots improved and they got bigger. So this was a series of capitals for, that we were building for the student union there. It's actually upside down to how it would be finished. So a group of us had set up a booth at the Works Festival in Edmonton. And at the end of the event, which was quite successful, I was asked if I'd put my work in the Edmonton Art Gallery store. So, naturally, old fears of not being accepted and imposter syndrome came back to visit me and I ran away and worked construction. Built some beautiful buildings though. So my time working construction took me to Saskatoon, Banff, Calgary, Hermiston, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I loved exploring each of the new locations and began to learn about what I would like as a place to live. 
Here's a scene from Eugene with the local wildlife blending into their surroundings. I love how the girl's hair is uh, blending with the cups on the ground. In Eugene, I, oh, I'm sorry, the hours working construction got to be too much and when we were in New Mexico, heat working 12 hours a day, six days a week, and the company asked us to work seven days a week, I'd had enough and I quit and flew back to Saskatchewan and then decided to hitchhike to Vancouver and work with my brother who had a pallet recycling business. But his artist, artist, whoop, there we go. So living in Vancouver, it really cemented my love for Saskatchewan's wide open spaces and peace of qu and quiet of rural life. And so after about eight months of living on 12th and Commercial in Vancouver, and seeing too little sunlight and too many people, having people try to break into our house multiple times, I married the woman that I'd met in New Mexico, and we set off in our station wagon for Saskatchewan. So while attending art school, some of us had dreamed a dream of having some sort of heritage building and moving into it and converting it into an art studio. And with my new wife, we went to Saskatchewan with that same desire and put the word out to friends. And so they uh, came back to us and said that there was a small village that had an old school for sale and uh, that we should go take a look at it. It had been empty for about 12 years, but it was still in good shape. Guess where that school was? Why would anybody ever live there? I think God must have a sense of humor. With friends and family in the area and living and exploring different communities and cities, I softened to the idea of settling somewhere small. So in September of 97, we approached the town hall with a lowball offer of $500, being willing to spend much more. And the town immediately accepted, and uh, they were encouraged by the prospect of a new business and tax revenue coming in. So we now owned a 1928, 2,600 square foot schoolhouse with an additional 1,600 square feet of bas basement and just under two acres of land. It was pretty amazing. So that's what it looked like when we moved in or started renovating. So it needed an entire gutting and renovation before it could be livable. So we quickly rented the cheapest dump of a house in neighboring Strasbourg and spent seven months renovating. Sadly, in the midst of all of this, our relationship fell apart and uh, I was left there alone. Early on, my father was less than enthusiastic about my choice of careers. Hi, Dad. He was, he was quite practical, still is, and concerned about how I'd make a living. So, with my divorce fresh and me quite depressed, how did I prove to him that I could make a living and a life in a rural village of less than 100 people? So in July 1998, I held my first pottery sale and open house. And I chose to build on some existing relationships that I had with the camp out at Arlington Beach. They had a large family camp that they would hold every summer. And on the Thursday of that week, there was usually nothing planned, so I planned my big opening event on that Thursday of that week. Um, and it was an amazing day. Over 400 people from the local community and the camp, every round, uh, showed up just to see what was happening in the old school and to buy some pottery. At one point, the lineup for the checkout was super long, and I saw there was at least uh, seven people in a row holding pictures ready to buy them. That was pretty encouraging for a start out. And I was so busy that I forgot to take pictures. This is not a picture of that day. This is from one of our winter open houses. So we've held uh, two winter open houses, or two open houses a year ever since then. Um, we developed our gallery spaces a little bit. So there's the first, probably that was probably one of the first sales on the left there, and then uh, developed some nice uh, reclaimed lumber into some shelving. Whoops. And then developed our lighting a little better, getting better, and the pottery's getting better as we go along too, so making lots of improvements. And another set of displays. So. so to be active in community, I started attending a local church. I uh, joined the local Optimist Club. I put on helped with many community events. Joined the Saskatchewan Craft Council. Took a place on the board eventually. Um, took part in work workshops with the Provincial Potters Guild Saskatera. And took my pots on the road and participated in craft sales across the province. I was mentored and took a role in, in the mentorship class through CARFAC. And... Uh, some of the other things I did was teach pottery classes to make extra money, 
and I took a variety of part-time and full-time jobs in lean seasons and some of the seasons when I was doubting whether I could make it. So I took a job driving school bus. I worked as an educational aide with special needs students, took on photography and videography gigs, and worked two summers at Arlington Beach as a resident photographer and videographer for the summer kids' camps. And then in 2010, I remarried and found my partner, Nadia, and uh, yeah, we've been married 12 years now, obviously, and uh, she runs a lot of the business side of things, and we're working out quite well together, so. Um, I made friends with artists in the area and was part of founding two artist collectives, the Last Mountain Art Collective and the Regina Art Collective. As collectives, we put on shows and started a local art and craft tour. It, was, it had stops in three different towns. Uh, I traveled to teach workshops, benefited from the Art Smarts teaching program, and a creative Saskatchewan grant money. And I started making one-of-a-kind pieces. So 24 years later, my dad has changed his mind about me being a potter and is very proud of the work I'm doing. Uh, so what are our successes in my life as a potter and artist? What, what, what do they look like to me? So success could mean... Oh, hello. Oh, there we go. Success could mean being hired to make commissioned work. So Kristen, thank you very much. So this was a commissioned piece of w one of the mugs that Sask Sask Galleries uh, asked me to make to give out to the member galleries. And I'm starting to call this my $100,000 mug. So um, the red dot mean represents the red dot placed beside some purchased artworks. So, and, uh, so the commission itself was a really worthwhile business endeavor, but I had no idea where it was going to lead. Uh, years prior to this commission, I contacted the Yvette Moore Gallery in Moose Jaw about getting our pottery into there. And hearing no reply, I just continued on thinking that uh, the venue was closed to us. So years later, after completing the mug commission, I uh, stepped off the plane, I think I was just coming back from Calgary, turned my phone on and there was an email from Yvette Moore, very apologetic about having started to reply to us seven years ago and then losing the email and forgetting all about it. And so uh, she invited us to come into their store because of that mug. And uh, these are some of our displays from there. And um, so the sales from that connection that was made through Sask Galleries Association have been, are, are heading toward $100,000 plus worth of business for us. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, yeah, we're, we're now selling among the top sellers there. So it's pretty good. Teapots. Every potter wants to make a good teapot. Not all potters make good teapots. These are some of my early Duval ones. And the one on the right has a bamboo handle. Um, and it's part of a, a bigger story of where my antler handled teapot started. Um, at one point, I've been given tea by a friend in a teapot that actually had a hollow handle that allowed the tea to go into it. So you would burn your hand when you're trying to pick it up. It was horrible. I gave him a new teapot. Um, but it set me on a mission to make really good teapots. and started me thinking about things like bamboo and stuff like that, which are fine, but they're not local and they're not something that I had a lot of influence on creating. So I started experimenting with local woods and found materials, and a neighbor gave me a box of shed antlers and uh, began a whole bunch of experiments and came up with uh, eventually what became these. So success for me could be in 2016 having three antlered to handle teapots similar to this one, chosen to go down to Scottsdale, Arizona with a Sask Galleries show. And I got to show here. And you'll probably recognize some artists in there, and I was blown away to be in the room with these artists, especially when I found out that a couple of them were Order of Canada recipients. And I was very, very... Uh, happy to find out that all three of my teapots sold at that sale. So I mentioned earlier about renovating my room and wanting a mad science lab. Success for me could be having a basement workshop that feels a lot like a mad science lab and using carving tools similar to that Dremel I was given as a boy at summer camp. I used to have my antlers strewn all over the floor when I was sorting them out and I kept tripping on them and I realized at some point I was going to injure myself badly and develop this hanging system, which is much better. So, 
living in a small town, for me, I like to explore the history of it. So this is in a probably 50s or 60s picture of Duval, at pro probably near its max population of about 400, and I said earlier, it's down to less than 100 people now, so there's been a lot of change in this community. Oh yeah, the arrow is, of course, my studio. There it is again. And my button timer buzzer is telling me, you're almost out of time. I better hurry. All right, so there's Duval School. There's a ribbon cutting at an elevator. They hadn't had many ribbon cuttings in a while, so I think when the town took our offer, they were pretty happy to have a new business. And success for me is to participate in my own ribbon cutting. So this is the ribbon cutting at the lobby gallery in Regina. And uh, since we've been open, 2017, uh, we've hung over 13 shows there just as Regina Art Collective and we, uh, when we opened it we partnered with Sagewiwak Indigenous Art Collective and uh, they put on their own shows as well. They've since left the gallery for, for different venue but it was uh, wonderful to be able to share the space with them. Here's a few slides of our opening show. Another successful day when uh, Sask Arts asked me if I would submit some pieces for the permanent collection. So this is the piece that ended up being purchased for that. And that, of course, wasn't amazing enough. They then took the piece and displayed it at the legislature. So this is in the rotunda at the legislature and there's a really beautiful art exhibit there with a whole bunch of Saskatchewan artists. Success could be a commission to create a baptismal for the chapel at Luther College in Regina. I felt like it was a serendipitous God occurrence when they approached me to, to make the large bowl. They wanted about a two foot wide bowl for it and also inquired if I'd be interested in making the base. They were planning on making the base out of old elevator timbers to represent some of the provincial history and I inquired if I'd want to do that. At that point I got quite excited because we were sitting around my table that I had made out of reclaimed elevator wood. And so that it was the start of a, a beautiful, uh, one of my most uh, uh, special projects that I've been able to work on. So thinking about it, I started thinking about the biblical passages of uh, Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 13 about the parables of the sower because I wanted you know, to think about Saskatchewan and farming and all those things that were around me. So each of these, uh, the inlay on here is made out of deer antler as well and some of it's been dyed. So this first one was from Matthew 13. As a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up quick and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, 160 or 30 times what was sown. And there's the bowl. So the bowl is two feet wide and the piece is about 40 inches high. So that would definitely be a success. Success could be a uh, full page article in the Western Producer, which then led to a 15 minute video on the Prairie Par Farm Report, which was, I don't know how many times they played it. It was one of their most played videos for a while. So. And then it could be getting front page of the uh, Star Phoenix and the Leader Post. That blew me away it was, and brought so many people to our studio. And very, very honoring and humbling at the same time. Now success could also be having the broken pottery shard pile grow over the years, which represents quality control in our work and quite proud of that shard pile. If anyone wants to make a mosaic, I have lots of shards. Success could be finding your work on Kijiji for $7. <laughs> I've found it at garage sales and all sorts of places. Success could also be having a painter friend use your work in her work and then uh, trading for that painting. One of her recent big successes was actually during COVID lo lockdown when we were struggling to find out how to survive as a business. 
So we couldn't have our indoor sales anymore because we have the two open houses. The winter one has to be indoor, but what we decided we'd move the summer one outside and extend the, the hours that we held it over two days rather than one. And so we rented the 2540 tent. We were nervous about whether people would, people would come and we ended up doubling our sales from the last year. So it was an amazing event. And so we've, we've done that twice more since then and started inviting other creative friends to come and join us. So here's a little video clip. This is the lineup at our second annual open house. That lineup was three hours long, 45 minutes to get through it. Now, part of that was our fault because we didn't have two registers open, but we didn't expect the volume of people to come. So this is, we basically moved everything out of the house. And then in the park next door, we've uh, invited uh, a bunch of our fr artist friends and some other friends. We have some uh, Red Seal chefs that are, produce local food there. And Could do a little more volume. Or there's no volume? Okay, that's the, man, the Regina Mandolin Orchestra they're playing. And the guy on the end is uh, a good friend of Regina Art Collective and a mentor of ours, Harvey Lennon, who's an amazing art collector. So. so you get a sense of that. So there's an the aerial shot of this year's sale where we invited 11 artists into the thing. Got severely hailed on, but still was successful. So as nice as all of those sort of accolades and commercial things are, they pale a little bit in comparison to the successes I feel when I hear stories of the impact that my pots have. So I've talked about church and all sorts of stuff, so I have a, I have a deep spiritual practice in my life, and one of those practices is that I pray over the objects as they go out into the world, that anybody who receives them is gonna be blessed and gonna be able to bless others with the, the artworks and the, the pottery that I make. So here's one report. So it wasn't this pot exactly, but one of my Saskatchewan Mount teapots was purchased by someone who had just come out of rehab. They'd been missing from of the business. They'd come into it very often and been gone for the month that they needed to be away. And so when the owner started talking to them about it, they started talking about these objects. And he decided that he wanted to use one of my teapots in the new rituals in his life so that he could uh, have a tea ceremony with his wife in the evenings and... Uh, yeah, that it would give them something to replace the old habits that they had. And so that really is kind of at the core of what I love to hear that happens when my work goes out there. My other success is uh, Hillary. She's a local woman who grew up on a farm right outside of Duval. And she had many experiences like I did as a creative kid in a farming, hockey, and hunting town. We now spend days creating in the studio, listening to fantasy and science fiction audiobooks, and putting on songs like Hathaway's What is Love on repeat forever to see who will crack and be the first to shut it off. Success is knowing that when life gets scary, you have friends. So these are all my Regina Art Collective friends. Success is knowing and learning that you can ride your bike all winter in Saskatchewan if you dress properly. And success is a sense of gratitude for this life God's blessed me with. And I wrote this as a Facebook post that I wrote uh, after last year's winter open house. So gratitude. Uh, Facebook asks us to answer the question, what's on your mind when starting up a post? Today my mind is contemplating gratitude for the people who support our businesses, for the place I live, the beautiful woman I live with, and the scruffy rescued dog who finally started playing with me after six months. I was out taking jet for an early Sunday morning run. It was so beautiful with this fog shrinking my world, the sound of my bike tire compressing the flair of fluffy snow covering the gravel road, and the dog sniffing around as he trotted beside me. Looking at the tracks, I thought of how often as a creative person I feel like I'm on the same road o alone over and over. It's beautiful, like these tracks from the past few rides, but these solitary times are all po pointing me further into community. This ride always brings me back to my beautiful little village. My pottery work always brings me back to the community of people who support our business. Thank you for being part of the beautiful moments in life. I'm grateful. And finally, success is finding a Duval hat that someone had thrown out and wondering why they would ever do that and wearing it with pride because this place is home. So if you ever want to stop by the studio, you'll be welcome to Duval.